everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about myths of endings in Hinduism. Um, so for this uh, discussion, we're going to talk about personal endings. Um, what is the goal or what is the expectation after death uh, in Hinduism? how to achieve that goal, and also how Hinduism views the ending of the world. Um, so a story about the, the how the world will end. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about up here is moksha. Um, so we've already mentioned some core concepts for Hinduism. We've talked about Brahman, remember, which is that high god, uh, which is a different conception of God than Western religious traditions. It's this idea of, you know, this all-encompassing force or energy in the universe. Uh, and really a more true statement is that the universe itself is God, right? The universe itself, everything is Brahman. There's nothing in this world that is outside of Brahman. And we've also talked about uh, the concept of Atman. Um, and remember, our Atman is our individual soul. Uh, so those are, those are concepts that we need to have down before we can go on to talk about moksha. Um, so remember also, in historical myths, we talked about samsara. We talked about that cycle of life, death, and rebirth that we're all stuck in. Remember, we're all trapped in samsara. We live a life, we die, and we're reborn again. And that happens again and again and again. But it's not a blessing, right? It's not immortality, it's a curse because life ultimately, life in samsara, ultimately is marked by suffering. There is more suffering, more pain uh, in our lives than there is joy. Um, because of the tragedies and then the difficult circumstances that we all go through, uh, and of course more fundamentally, because living a life in samsara means that we age, we get sick, and we die. Uh, and we have to live with that knowledge. And we don't have to do it just once, we have to do it countless times. And not only do we get old, get sick, and die, everyone that we love uh, does as well. So uh, we want to get out of samsara, right? We want release from samsara. We want to get off that wheel of life, death, and rebirth. And that's what moksha is. So moksha is the goal for all Hindus. The word moksha is Sanskrit, and it means liberation. So it is the liberation from samsara. It is getting off of that wheel, not having to live another lifetime in samsara. So in a very basic sense, achieving moksha means that you live a human life, because um, you would definitely only achieve moksha from a human life. You die, and you don't come back. Okay. So in one sense, it is a form of non-existence. Uh, or is it a form, is it, it's a form of non-existence of any type of existence that we know. Right? It is being released from the existence of samsara, that existence that is marked by suffering. Um, so what exactly moksha is, uh, is, is something that is not exactly explained uh, in Hinduism. Um, and we'll see this occurring again and again in religious traditions. Most religious traditions have an idea of some type of altered state or altered existence after death, whether that's moksha, whether it's Buddhism's nirvana, whether it's heaven, whether it's paradise. Um, and so that's always the goal. Um, but religious traditions don't often sort of concretely explain what that is, right? Because they say no one, you know, no one has gone and come back. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but we know that it's going to be so much better than life here, right? If life here on earth, life in samsara, is marked by suffering, it means that moksha is the opposite of that. Moksha is an existence of bliss. And we could say that, you know, all the limitations of our own existence here in samsara, right, we're limited in our lifetime, we know that we're going to die, we're limited in our knowledge, we're limited in our understanding, right, because human understanding and divine understanding are always on a different level. Um, and we're limited in our joy because of the suffering. In moksha, all of those limitations are erased, right? We get to live, we get to exist in a state that is infinite, that we have complete understanding, and we have infinite joy. So it is an existence that is rid of all the finite limitations that we have to uh, encounter in this world, in samsara. So moksha is liberation, it's the goal, it's getting out of samsara. Um, so how do you achieve moksha? You achieve moksha by acquiring 
something called Ganana Atman. So that next phrase there on the PowerPoint, Ganana Atman. So if I want to achieve moksha, I have to achieve Ganana Atman. Uh, and Ganana Atman uh, is a term that we could say a, a definition or a translation is self-realization. Um, and But really a more precise uh, translation of it. The word Ganana means knowledge in Sanskrit. So I want knowledge of my Atman, right? Remember, Atman is soul. It is our own personal individual soul. Despite the fact that lifetime upon lifetime in samsara, everything else about me changes, right? Whether I'm a human being or an animal changes, whether I'm male or female changes, what the circumstances are in my life change, but my Atman, my soul remains the same because it is eternal, right? It goes with me lifetime after lifetime. So in order to achieve liberation, I have to ch achieve knowledge of my soul, self-realization. Basically, I have to come to a true understanding of my soul. The first step in that process is, of course, coming to understand that everything else about my identity changes, right? To come to an understanding that my body is not who I am. My gender is not who I am. My, my life as a human being is not who I am. The only thing about my identity that is true is my soul, right? Everything else is just temporary. Everything else is just a circumstance that happens to be uh, what, what my life is like right now. And, and that's a process, right? It's a process for you to come to an understanding that your body is not who you are. Right? Your, your gender is not who you are. Your personality is not who you are. Your circumstances in life is not who you are. You, that you have a soul, right? First, I guess first step in the process is understanding that you have an eternal soul and that soul is your true identity, right? Everything else about you is incidental. Everything else about you does not matter as much as your soul because that's eternal. Then the next part of that process is realizing, well, if my soul is eternal and the only thing else in existence that's eternal is God, is Brahman, then actually I have to come to understand that my soul and Brahman, my soul and God, Atman and Brahman are one. They are actually the same. They are one substance, one essence. So achieving moksha means coming to a true understanding of who I am, that my soul, my Atman is my personal identity, and that my Atman and Brahman are one, right? My soul is not just eternal, it's divine. I have a divine spark within me, which is my soul. And that divine spark, whatever that divinity is made of, whatever that substance is, it is the same as God, right? And so that has several implications, right, in, in coming to achieve moksha. One, it means that this is not my true home, right? Samsara is not my true home. My Atman being separated from Samsara is not the way things are supposed to be. My Atman ultimately should rejoin Brahman, should become one with Brahman, should be with Brahman. So that is actually how moksha is described by most Hindus. That achieving moksha means that my Atman, my soul, returns to God, right? I don't, my Atman doesn't have to come back and live another lifetime in samsara because my Atman gets to go where it really belongs, right? Go where it should be, which is with God. So moksha is actually reunification with God, right? It is being with God instead of being in samsara. So I have to understand that my Atman is Brahman, right? That Atman and Brahman are one. So there, there's a lot of different stages in this process of, of achieving Ganana Atman, right? We can go through it in a few sentences, as I just did, right? It's important to remember, as I mentioned before, um, that in religious traditions, there are certain doctrines and theologies that we can pretty much summarize in a couple of sentences, right? Oh, I'm a Hindu. I have an Atman. My Atman is the same as Brahman. Okay, done. Last lifetime. Uh, I'm going to achieve moksha. No, right? That's not how it works. Um, this, this 
understanding uh, is assumed in Hinduism, right? It doesn't just take one lifetime to achieve this. It takes multiple lifetimes. So this is not something that is easy to understand. Um, it's something that takes a lot of practice and a lot of work. And most importantly, it's not just something that you comprehend on an intellectual level. You have to experience it, right? I can only truly understand that I have a soul and that that soul is the same as God if I have an experience of that, right? If I experience God, I have an encounter with God or with my own soul. So there's also a strong experiential dimension to this as well, right? I, I have to have that experience to truly understand that this is so. So understanding my soul, understanding that my soul is Brahman, means understanding that my soul's true home is with God, and it also has another important implication, which is the fact that I have to come to the understanding that I have an Atman, right? So I have a divine spark within me. I have a bit of God within me. But that means that every living being in samsara does as well, right? Every other human being has an Atman, every animal. And as I mentioned, there's other categories of living beings in samsara. So that means something very profound, right? That means that ultimately all beings and samsara are the same because we all have an Atman whose source is all the same, right? Whose source is God, whose source is divinity. And that means that all other living beings are divine as well. So that should change the way one experiences the world, right? To see the world of diversity and difference, um, like, like we all do, right? That I experience myself as separate from other people. Um, you know, this is me and that's you and we're different and animals are different from humans. Um, that's one way of experiencing the world and that's the way the majority of people experience the world. For someone who is an enlightened being, for somebody who has come to this true understanding, this Ganana Atman, they don't see the world with difference, right? They see the world ultimately as Brahman. Right? Because every living being is divine, has this divine Atman within them, and they experience the world as the emanation of Brahman. Right? It's one thing to say, oh, the universe itself is an expression of God. The universe itself is an emanation from God. That's a nice, beautiful sentence. Right? But somebody who has achieved this knowledge, the understanding is that they actually experience the world this way. They experience the world as divine and they experience all living beings as one, right? Because all of us, are our true self, our true core is our Atman, and ultimately our souls are the same because all of our souls are divine. So coming to this understanding, this is what Ganana Atman is, right? It's understanding that I have a soul, my soul is my true identity, that my Atman is ultimately divine, it is the same as God, it belongs with God, and therefore, everything in the universe is also one and divine as well. So again, this is, this is how one achieves moksha. And the understanding is that this takes many, many lifetimes to get to, right? That, that there's, not, there's not just, you know, one quick, easy way to do it. Um, that this is why we have to live lifetime after lifetime is because this is such a difficult thing to understand and experience in life. So that's, that's what moksha is, that's what Ganana Atman is. So we achieve moksha by attaining Ganana Atman, right? Self-realization, knowledge of soul, ultimately that my soul is the same as Brahman. So this is the goal for all Hindus, is to achieve moksha and achieve Ganana Atman. So I'm just going to sit down a little bit lower here. Um, but there's an understanding in Hinduism that there's multiple ways to achieve that. Right? There's not just one way to work towards moksha. Um, there are multiple different paths or yogas, uh, and people choose different paths based on their personality, based on their interests, and oftentimes people choose more than one path. So it's important to know Hinduism, remember we mentioned before, is, is a very tolerant tradition, it's a very diverse tradition, and one important part of that is that there's not just one way to be a good Hindu. There's not just one way to be a devout Hindu. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through those paths to moksha. Um, they're called the four yogas. Uh, and you can see here the terms, right? There's ganana yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and karma yoga. 
The reason that they're called yogas, um, yoga is a Sanskrit term, um, and the word yoga uh, is actually has a connection to the English word yoke, um, not yoke like an egg yolk, um, but the verb yoke. It's not a very commonly used word anymore in the English language, um, but yoke, Y-O-K-E, um, means to bind, right? So a yoga is something that binds two things together. And you may be able to guess the two things, right, that we need to bind together to achieve moksha is Brahman and Atman. Right? So the idea is that each one of these paths, each one of these yogas, in a sense, binds our soul to God. But in another, right, more true sense, it helps us to realize that the two are already bound together. Right? Our soul is already one with God. Um, and, and that that's what we want to, that's the state that we want to achieve. Um, so there's these four different paths, these four different yogas. As I mentioned, um, there's not like one that's better than another. Um, it's, it's considered, they're considered equal. And it just kind of depends on your personality uh, and, and what type of activities you enjoy, what, what type of individual you are. Um, so the first path is Ganana Yoga. Uh, and we've already been introduced to the term Ganana, which means knowledge. Right? So this is the path of knowledge. So Ganana Yoga would be for somebody who is kind of the eternal student. Right? There are some people, um, some of you may be in this class, who love learning. Right? You love reading, you love studying, you love taking classes. And maybe you know, even after you get your degree, you're going to be the type of person that continues to take classes because you just love to learn new things about the world. This is the path for that type of individual. Right? So the understanding is some people learn about Atman and Brahman through knowledge, through study. So someone who was embarking on this path would be a student of Hinduism, right? Somebody who is reading the sacred scriptures, somebody who would study the Vedas, study the Upanishads, study the Bhagavad Gita, um, learn from a teacher or guru, uh, have discussions and debates and dialogues about these sacred texts, which talk about Brahman and talk about Atman. So they would sort of come at this, uh, this issue, trying to achieve moksha, more from an intellectual perspective, right? So try to come to an intellectual understanding of one's soul and God and the connection that they have. Um, so that's one path uh, that, that may be uh, appropriate for some people. It's not the most popular, though, for sure, because that's something that, that only certain people sort of have that uh, temperament to really dedicate themselves to that path. Uh, the next path, bhakti yoga, is definitely by far the most popular. Most Hindus participate in bhakti yoga to some extent. And bhakti means devotion. Okay, So this is what Prothero calls devotional Hinduism. Um, and, and he you know, sort of emphasizes how popular and how this, uh, this type of Hinduism has, has really taken over um, for, for many Hindus. And bhakti yoga uh, is basically the path of devotion or dedication to a single god or goddess or multiple gods or goddesses. Uh, as we mentioned before, what most people know about Hinduism from the start is that it's polytheistic, right? That there's lots of these individual gods and goddesses. And our, our next dimension doctrine is when we're going to talk about some of those individual gods and goddesses. Um, but the, the idea behind that is that individual Hindus are devoted uh, to certain gods or goddesses. And usually how this works is it's simply a family tradition. Um, you are born into a family who worships certain deities and you continue to worship those. Um, so when people get married, right, probably each person brings, you know, into the, the marriage, well, my family, you know, I grew up worshiping Shiva um, and my husband, you know, worships Ganesh. And so on our family altar, we have statues of both. Um, so usually it's sort of a family tradition that gets passed down um, of what deities certain individuals are devoted to. But there are definitely cases of uh, individuals being uh, especially devoted to a certain god or goddess um, because it's connected to something in their life. Um, as we'll see, for example, there's a goddess of learning. Um, so a lot of times students are devoted to her while they're in school. Um, and it could also simply be that, that someone learns about a different god or goddess and they basically fall in love with that deity, right? They feel a strong connection to that deity. The path of bhakti yoga is also a way of coming to that understanding of Atman and Brahman, 
right? And it's this idea that we'll talk about more, which is that actually all of those individual gods and goddesses in Hinduism are understood to be different expressions and manifestations of Brahman. If Brahman is everything, right, if Brahman is infinite, then Brahman can be represented by any of these individual gods or goddesses. So worshiping an individual god or goddess is seen as a pathway to better understanding Brahman, right? But human beings, we, we need something individual, right? Brahman is, you know, is infinite, is everything. You cannot draw a picture of Brahman. Brahman has no gender. Brahman has no mythology. So in Hinduism, there is an understanding that that's hard to worship. That's hard to fall in love with. We as human beings want a face of God. We want some sort of humanity in God because that's something that we can worship. That's something that we can be devoted to. So the understanding is if I love, if I fall in love with and become devoted to an individual god or goddess, that can be sort of my glimpse onto the, you know, the infinity that is God, uh, that is Brahman, right? It's sort of a small pinpoint hole onto that vastness that is Brahman. So through learning to love my chosen deity, showing that deity my devotion, I start to learn how to, one, sort of move my focus away from myself, right? Not just be in love with myself, but to truly love God, right? And that gives me a glimpse of the, the, the expansiveness of the infinity that is Brahman. So the understanding in bhakti yoga is that through my chosen deity, right, I learn how to worship God, I learn how to love God, and that teaches me a bit about Brahman. Right, that helps me to get closer to Brahman through love and through devotion. So bhakti yoga is an incredibly popular path. Um, as I said, most Hindus participate in bhakti yoga to some extent. Um, and, and it's also seen as a path towards achieving moksha. Um, it can help one on their path to moksha. Uh, the third one here is raja yoga. And actually, this is one that Prothero doesn't include in his text, but it's important that I to know that I want you to know about this one. Um, so we are discussing four different yogas, even though Prothero only mentions three of them in his text. Um, he doesn't go over Raja Yoga. Uh, the word Raja uh, is Sanskrit for royal, and it's basically the path of meditation. Um, so a lot of you, again, this may be something you're familiar with, with Hinduism already, um, that uh, many Hindus practice yoga it's something that, that Buddhism um, also continued after Hinduism. Um, but the path of meditation is basically the path of experience, right? If, if Gnana Yoga is the path of knowledge, Bhakti Yoga is the path of love, Raja Yoga is the path of experience, right? So the idea of meditation um, is actually to quiet the mind, right? To quiet your thoughts. Hinduism and Buddhism agree that our minds are, are like a runaway pack of horses. Our thoughts are constantly going, right? We're constantly thinking of things. And because of that, we're, we're, we're distracted all the time. It's hard for us to focus and to truly just be aware of our circumstances and aware of ourself. So the path of meditation, the Raja Yoga path, says that if I can practice quieting my thoughts, stopping my thoughts, clearing out my thoughts, I and, and turn inward, basically to truly experience myself without the clutter and the distraction of my mind going constantly, right, telling me when I have to wake up, what I have to do, all the million things that I have to get done, all that sort of stuff, I can actually experience my Atman, right? I don't have, someone doesn't have to tell me that I have a personal eternal soul. I will actually experience my soul. Right? Through meditation, I can have experiential knowledge that this, you know, that the external, the physical is not my true identity. All of this is temporary, that my soul is my true self. My soul is my true identity. And then in those who follow the path of Raja Yoga say that that's one of the first, you know, that that's the first goal. And then after that, right, you turn your attention to God, to Brahman and you can experience unification with Brahman, right? You can experience the connection between your soul and God. This is what is called Samadhi. That's that next term down there. Samadhi is absorption in God, 
right? So it is the goal of those who meditate, um, of, you know, you ever heard of yogis who sort of embark on this extreme path of meditation, who say that basically if they can overcome the distractions of this world, they can experience their own soul and they can have their soul experience God, right? They can actually rest in God. They can have sort of a taste of moksha in this world. So that is the, the path of, of meditation or the goal of the path of meditation um, is to not just understand this stuff intellectually, but to physically experience it. Um, or I should sort of say, you know, mindfully experience it. Um, so that's the third path. And it's also definitely not as popular as bhakti yoga. Um, meditation is something that is, it's difficult. Um, for those who have practiced it, you know that it's not easy. Um, and to really dedicate yourself to this path is not for everyone, right? It, it is a, it's a challenging path to take. Um, and the last uh, path here, the last yoga is karma yoga. And we've talked about karma already. The word karma simply means work in Sanskrit. Um, and the path of karma yoga here, right, we want to achieve good karma in this life. We can say the path of karma yoga is the path of selfless action. Right? It is the path of using our work, using our actions in this world to help others. So I can also start to see the unity of all people, the interconnectedness and oneness of all living beings by dedicating myself to others. Right? If I work on behalf of others, if I do actions in this world, I dedicate myself to others, right? I, I stop caring so much for myself and care for others first, then I can also start to glimpse this unity and this oneness of, of all living beings um, because I see our connection, right? I see the, the connection in all people that we all want the same things and we need the same things, we fear the same things, and we all suffer, right? So this is also seen as a, a way of achieving Gnana Yoga. Right? Because one of those realizations is that because we all have an eternal soul, we are actually all one and we are all the same. And to experience the world and experience others in that way. So those are our four yogas, our four paths to moksha. As I mentioned, it's, it's really kind of based on your own temperament and personality, uh, which path people choose. And for the most part, though, it's not like people choose just one path and like, this is my path. This is what I'm going to do for my whole life. Um, they, they combine, uh, mix and match different paths um, because everyone, of course, is trying to, you know, to be selfless, to help others. Um, they may try meditation and do it as much as they can. Uh, they may have their personal deities that they're dedicated to. And, of course, I've done some study of sacred knowledge, um, or sorry, sacred scriptures or sacred texts. Um, so these, these paths can all work together in an individual's life, uh, or there may be an individual who, who really is sort of drawn to one over the others and, and dedicates themselves to that. So those are our four yogas. Uh, then the last thing we're going to talk about for this dimension uh, is the ending of the world. Um, and I have, oh yeah, I have one more thing down there. Um, I have cyclical view of time. So it's important to know Hinduism, like many different religious traditions we'll study, does not believe or does not see our world as lasting forever. So the world in which we live now, it's not meant to last forever. It was never meant to exist eternally. Right? We mentioned in, in Myths of Origin that Hinduism understands the universe, the world, to have emanated out from Brahman. Right? So there was a beginning point to our universe. Um, the source of it is Brahman. And then there are other deities who help in the creation of the world, the creation of human beings. And we'll talk about those when we get to doctrine. Um, but the world will actually go back to its source eventually. The world was created and the world will return to Brahman. Um, so Hinduism actually sees time as a cycle. Right? That universe is created, universe is destroyed. Then, once it's destroyed, it will be created again, destroyed again, created again, destroyed again. So this doesn't happen just once, it happens multiple times. But the time span that we're talking about is so expansive that the understanding is that you know, no, no individual human being would ever, uh, you know, would ever experience this, this cycle of, of creation and destruction. Um, so this is supposed to take eons and eons, right? Millions of years to take place. Um, but the important part to know for Hinduism is that the understanding is that the world will not be destroyed until every jiva, and I have that term here, 
uh, jiva is, is kind of used interchangeably with atman. Um, atman is our soul, a jiva is an individual. So, and, and every individual has a soul. So the world will not be destroyed until every single jiva returns to Brahman. So the world is created. There is sort of a set number of souls, a set number of Atmans in, in this universe. We go through our cycles of life and death and rebirth. But ultimately, right, it's not just that moksha is the goal for every Hindu. Hindus understand moksha to be the destiny of every living being. So everyone will eventually achieve moksha. The question is just when, right? Where are you on that path? Are you, you know, at the beginning of that path? Are you near the end? Right? Do you have one more lifetime to live? Do you have a thousand more lifetimes to live? So in, in Hinduism, it is what we call a benign view of history, right? Everyone eventually gets saved. Everyone eventually returns to Brahman. Moksha is not like heaven. It's not a reward. It is your destiny. It is what everyone uh, will eventually achieve. So in Hinduism, there is no hell, right? There is no place of eternal punishment. The only hell that there is in Hinduism is the hell that you would create for yourself by achieving a lot of bad karma and having a lot of not fun lives to live. Um, but that would eventually end, right? That's only temporary. Eventually, you would live enough lifetimes, you would work your way back up, and you would eventually achieve moksha. Um, so this is something that is for everyone. Um, and that's another reason why there is sort of this, again, this tolerance uh, and understanding in Hinduism, because the idea is that, you know, there's not people who are on like the right path or the wrong path, that sort of understanding. It's just where you are on the path. Everyone's on the same path. Everyone is, is, you know, starting somewhere and eventually working up to moksha. It's just a matter of how far you are on that path, right? How close you are to achieving it. So ultimately, every single one of us will achieve moksha. We will all reunite with God. Um, we will all be reabsorbed into Brahman. And then when that happens, that's when the world will be destroyed and another universe will be created. So it's a cyclical view of time, of creation and destruction, right? Just like samsara, right? Individuals go through this cycle of life, death, and rebirth, and the universe itself goes through this cycle of life, death, and rebirth. But that won't happen until all jivas are reabsorbed into God, right? Until everyone has achieved moksha. Um, so it's, it's this benign view of the universe that no one, no one gets left out, right? No one gets left behind. Okay, so that's our myths of endings, um, and for our next dimension, we'll talk about doctrine. All right.